great to be with you tonight. As, um, as Pete said, my name's Sam. I'm part of the team here at STC. Um, and as James wonderfully pointed out, um, uh, as he's stepping on, I'm, I'm the creative lead. So I see like, um, I spoke to someone earlier and they kind of said, that's a really broad title. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> kind of is. Um, so like worship, um, all things creative, production, um, social media, website, emails, you name it. Um, so we're always looking for um, enthusiastic and passionate people to get involved. Um, with all things creative at SDC. So if you, if you play an instrument, if you sing, uh, if you take photos, if you make videos, if you do sound stuff, whatever, I'd love to talk to you and get you involved um, in creative things here at SDC. Um, I'm married to Hannah. She can't be here tonight because she's looking after our f now 15-month-old baby girl, Joni, who's hopefully in bed. Um, but we'll find out when we get back. So... Tonight, folks, we're reading from Luke chapter 10. So if you've got a Bible, I'd love you to jump to it. And this passage tonight contains arguably one of the most well-known Bible stories. It's one of those stories from the Bible that um, like permeates into society and culture. Like if you stop someone on the street and ask them to name a Bible story, the likelihood is they'd probably say, um, I don't know, Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark, probably the Good Samaritan. It's a story that um, is well known, it's, it's well understood. Um, at the very least, people understand the concept of what it is to be a good Samaritan, whether or not they know it's even from the Bible, or whether they know it's like Jesus' teachings or not is a different question. But people know what it is to be a good Samaritan. And if you're here tonight and you don't know what the good Samaritan is, let me just explain it to you. So good Samaritan might describe someone who um, goes out of their way to help someone else, who's acting in a selfless manner particularly with someone that you maybe don't know. So it's not like it's a friend or a family member, but maybe um, you see a, a mother trying to get on the bus with a pram and she's struggling. So you go out of your way and you help her on the bus. And they say, oh, you, you're a good Samaritan, thank you. Or you help an old lady cross the road, that kind of thing. That's what we might understand as the concept of, of being a good Samaritan. But for the vast majority of people, they might not know that this comes from the Bible. And, you know, we, we get that this is a good lesson for life, isn't it? It's a helpful and important virtue. And it's something that I think we can all agree upon, that it's something that we should all emulate. It's something we should copy. We should all be good Samaritans, shouldn't we? And I think the world would be a better place for it. But I think there's something in this story that maybe we haven't quite unpacked. Maybe it's, there's a layer that we haven't quite explored that I think God might want to speak to us tonight. What's the thing that God wants to speak to us tonight in a new way? Because if you're new to the Bible, the beauty of the Bible is we can read it for a lifetime. Yet if we come back to the same verse, the same story, the same passage of Scripture, actually God can speak to us in a new and profound way. And that's my prayer for us tonight. So before we set off, as we often do at the 7 p.m., um, I'd love to take a moment just to talk to the person next to you. And I'd love to ask the question of, have you ever been a good Samaritan? Or have you ever had a good Samaritan moment to you? I don't know how you phrase that. Have you ever been a good Samaritan or has anyone been a good Samaritan to you? So just turn to the person next to you, ask that question.
Good stuff. Give me 20 more seconds. 20 more seconds. You had more time, but that's fine. Amazing. So hopefully we've understood that we know kind of what the Good Samaritan is. We, we get the concept. In our society, we understand what it means. And it's something that's celebrated. And if we leave the passage that we're going to read tonight as merely that, as we've identified now, I think it's a, it's a good lesson. It's a, it's a good thing to uphold. Because um, we ought to be, as people, Good Samaritans, especially if we're followers of Jesus. And if our understanding and our application is nothing more than this, it's a good thing. I think that's how Jesus, if that, if that is merely it, that's okay. That's how Jesus would have wanted it to be. But as is so often the case with Jesus' words, as we begin to just dig that little bit deeper and unpack the layer upon layer upon layer of meaning in what he says, I think there's something for each of us tonight to learn something in a deeper and more profound way. In the way that... I don't know if you've experienced this, but like it stirs your soul in a way that can reorientate our hearts on the person of Jesus, that spurs us on to be more like him and to live like the kingdom of God is at hand. So let's just take that little bit, that dive a little bit deeper just for a moment. So there are two things that I quickly want to point out. First of which is the relationship in the story um, between the, the Jews and the Samaritans and the significance of that. Secondly, um, I want to talk about the role of the priest and the Levite in this story and why it's important and why Jesus specifically identifies these two characters and gives them a description because it would be really easy just to say like man one and man two and leave it at that. But he, he refers to them as a priest and a Levite and that's really important. And then hopefully, we're going to understand a little bit more of Jesus' heart for people and how, if we follow Jesus, and I recognize that there might be some people here tonight who don't, and that's okay, you're very welcome. But if we follow Jesus, how it might reorder our hearts for people that are broken, hurting, and lost. So that's the plan for tonight. We're going to read the passage in just a moment, but um, first let me just quickly set the scene. So we pick up this story in Luke's Gospel. Gospel, if you're new to the Bible, is, just means good news. Um, and essentially, you've got this guy, Luke. It's thought that he's a physician or a doctor. Um, he's a disciple of Jesus, an apostle. He's been following him around for about three years, hanging out with Jesus, seeing what he does, um, spending time with him, watching Jesus, listening to him. Um, so what we're reading tonight is a, it's a first-hand eyewitness account of the life of Jesus. And at this moment that we're reading in Luke 10, in just a moment, Jesus is traveling around from town to town with his friends. And he's going to these villages and um, he's meeting people, he's healing them, he's setting them free, he's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, essentially. He's kind of saying there's a, there's a better life to be had, following Jesus and, and following God and being in relationship with God the Father, their creator. And as you'd expect, you know, Jesus is a cool guy. He's gathering a bit of a crowd, people want to follow him, people want to hang around with him. And, you know, you've got a kind of a ragtag bunch of people, um, a real mixture of Jewish society. It's kind of like a melting pot of people. You've got tax collectors, you've got um, prostitutes, you've got tradespeople, you've got fishermen, you've got religious leaders. And there are kind of two categories of people that are following Jesus. There's the ones that follow him because they love him, and they've heard what he has to say, and they're like, yeah, I want to follow this guy. And then there's the other category of people who are really skeptical about Jesus. And the second category of people, more often than not, is the religious leaders who we're about to read about now, because they think Jesus is blasphemous. The stuff he's claiming is only the stuff that God could claim about himself. And basically, they, they want him gone, or better, they want him dead, because Jesus is a problem for the established order of things. He's rocking the boat, he's upsetting the status quo, and they need to do something about it. So here in the passage, if you've got your Bible, it's going to come up on the screens as well, Luke 10. One of the religious leaders, an expert of the law, as the text describes, he stands up to question Jesus. And I want you to remember the fact that he stands up, because that's, that's really important. So here we go. Luke chapter 10, starting from verse 25. And it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to chest Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. 
Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you to the Anglicans in the house. So remember the fact that I said the guy stands up. That's really important. So this expert of the law stands up to ask Jesus a question. And this, this guy would have been well respected. He would have been a scholar. Someone who was kind of held in well regard in Jewish society. He would have known the Torah like the back of his hand. He would have known it inside and out. He would have known the 613 mitzvah, um, the kind of Jewish laws in the, in, the, in, the tes- in the Old Testament. He would have known the, the couple of thousand rabbinical laws on top of that that kind of helped the Jews keep the 600, 613 mitzvah. He would have known these so well and how to apply them to his life. So he's an expert. This guy knows him stuff. And as a teacher himself, he would have followed the usual convention of the teacher sitting down and the students standing up to listen and to learn. It's kind of like the opposite of what's happening here. So in the, in the story, it's, it, he stands up to ask Jesus a question. And in doing so, he's essentially mocking Jesus. Because in standing up, he's putting himself in the position of a student. And he's basically saying, so, so rabbi, so teacher Jesus. He's mocking him. He's saying, if you're so smart, Jesus, tell me. Tell me, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And if you know anything about Jesus, he sees this a mile off. (laughs) He sees this a mile off, and he flips the question on his head. And he says, well, Mr. Expert, Mr. Mr. Man of the Law, how do you read it? You know the law so well. You know it like the back of your hand. How do you read it? You tell me. Then the expert replies, and he quotes Deuteronomy 6, which is a passage that it's really familiar. Uh, it's very famous. Um, it's a very famous prayer in Ju- Judaism as well. It's called the Shema. And it, it's what they, they say it, um, every day throughout the day. And it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and your mind. And being the expert he is, he then throws in this little nugget of Leviticus 19 for good measure, which says, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and Jesus, he's like, yep, congrats. You got it right. That's the answer. Great. But notice how Jesus doesn't repeat back to the expert the question that he's asked him. The expert asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But Jesus replies saying, do this and you shall live. Live, live as in live in the fullness of what God has for you. Live in the fullness of life. Live knowing that you're loved, forgiven, redeemed. Live as if the kingdom of God is near. And, you know, this already sets up to Jesus, like, what the, the kind of person that this religious leader is, that he's so entrenched in following the law that he's forgotten the one who gave it. He loves the law more than he loves the Lord. But Jesus says, love God, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love people, and you will know what it is to live. But at this point, the expert is probably getting a little bit hacked off by now. He's probably getting a bit wound up. So he throws Jesus even more of, um, if you know football, like a hospital pass. It's like a hospital pass question. Like he's trying to do it to trip him up, to catch him out. And the text even says he's trying to justify himself, which again is an insight into his attitude towards his salvation. 
because he's, he's trying to justify himself by his own ability to keep the law. And Jesus knows this. And the expert follows up with the question, who is my neighbor? And he's playing dumb because he's literally just given the answer to this question. He's quoted Leviticus 19, and it's going to come up on the screen. It says, do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so that you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So there's your answer, it seems. Your neighbor is your own people. It's your fellow Israelite. It's your family. It's your brother and sister. When the Lord calls us to love our neighbors, that's who he's calling us to. And at least that's what the expert of the law says. And yeah, that's true. But as we've said, in, in typical Jesus fashion, in typical Jesus fashion, he takes what he's understood, he takes what he's known, and he just takes it to that next level. And, and again, in, in true Jesus fashion, he proceeds to tell the story. He tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And if the story of the Good Samaritan, in my head, it's a funny place sometimes, but if it was a pantomime, each character would probably have a little bit of a different response. Have you ever been to a pantomime? You'd be a terrible pantomime audience. Have you ever been to a pantomime? That's more like it. <laughs> Each character, you know, has like a different response when they come on stage or when they say something. So if the guy who's been beaten up on the side of the road was a, um, in a pantomime, what would your response be? Would it be like, ah, oh, you know, that kind of sympathetic, ah, oh. it probably would be. What would the Good Samaritan be? Hey, come on, Good Samaritan. What about the priest? What about the Levite? Ah, oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, you kind of, you, you get who the bad guys and the good guys are in this story, don't you? But actually, for us in this context now, if you would have asked the people that were listening to Jesus 2,000 years ago, they probably would have had a slightly different response. When we say the guy who's been beaten up on the side of the road, it probably would have been the same response. It would have been a sympathetic, ah. Oh. But when you mentioned a Samaritan, best believe they would have gone, ooh, yes. They would have like brought the house down like the pantomime villain. Because you see, Jews and Samaritans despised each other. They hated each other. And you notice in the passage, the religious leader, he can't even bear say the name Samaritan. He says the one who has mercy on him. He doesn't say, Jesus says, which of the three, the people that he's named, um, should you, is, is, does the right thing? And the expert says, the one who has mercy on him rather than the Samaritan. So, yeah, Jews and Samaritans don't like each other. And to, to cut a very long story short, um, you've got the people of God, the Israelites. They're living under one kingdom, one nation. Um, but then after King David and Solomon, um, it gets split into two. And you've got the northern kingdom, which is known as Israel and Samaria. And you've got the southern kingdom, which is known as Judah. And basically, the northern kingdom is um, overtaken by the Assyrian Empire. And what the Assyrians do is this kind of process of assimilation to, to kind of conquer the people that they've invaded. And that looks like, over the course of generations, um, intermarriages between Jews and between the Assyrians. And after a few generations and a couple of hundred years, you end up with um, like a very ethnically mixed group of people to the extent that um, there was almost like a pseudo-Judaic belief system with a little bit of the Torah, a little bit of kind of what was understood in the law, and then some other kind of like pagan rituals and practices of the day. So you've got that happening up in the north, and then you've got the kingdom of Judah in the south, um, who were kind of holding true to, there's a lot of stuff going on anyway, it's, a long, it's cutting a long story short, but they were holding true, they were kind of staying faithful, and they would be seen as like the, the, the pure Jews. And the Jews in the south would view the Sam Samaritans as almost like, if you know Harry Potter, like half-blood. Like it's, it's really not very nice. So these guys really don't like each other, and it's quite messy. Now, Jesus is a Jew, and actually, throughout the scriptures, he has quite a few interactions with Samaritans. So first off, um, in fact, the first person that he tells is he's the Messiah is a Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, where she can't even come out during the normal time to go to the well because she's so ashamed of herself. She's been married five times. Jesus knows that. Yet she comes to, she comes to the well. Jesus is there. And, um, and he says that classic line of, um, the water you drink from will make you thirsty again, but if you drink from my living water, you'll never thirst again. 
And then he tells her that he's the Messiah. The first person Jesus tells he's the Messiah is a Samaritan woman. And then um, there's another point in the scriptures where, as Jesus and his disciples do, they go from town to town. And before they go into a town, Jesus sends some of his disciples ahead. And then James and John come back, and their nickname is Sons of Thunder. So it kind of tells you everything you need to know about them. But they come back and they say to Jesus, we went to Samaritan villages, and they didn't want anything to do with us. They weren't fussed about us. So they come back and they say, Jesus, should we call down the fire of heaven on them and destroy them all? And then Jesus is like, no, chill out, lads. Like, it's fine. And he rebukes them and he calms them down. So Jesus' attitude towards Samaritans is totally contrary to what would be expected of him. And his approach towards them is totally different. So that's the first thing in this story. And the important thing is that Jesus is saying that our neighbor, your neighbor is essentially your enemy. Your neighbor is your enemy. It may well be your own people, but it doesn't just stop there. Your neighbor is your enemy too. And it's easy enough to say, it's not that easy to do. It's a lot harder put into practice. And to use quite a, a current or present or slightly raw example, it's, it's the equivalent of, an, of like an IDF Israeli soldier who's wounded on the side of a road and a Hezbollah fighter is walking past. And what Jesus is saying is for the Hezbollah fighter to take off his weapon to cross the road to the other side and to help and assist this Israeli fighter, to put him on the back of his Jeep, drive him to the nearest town, risk the shame and humiliation of arriving with this Israeli soldier in the back of his Jeep and wanting to help him. That's essentially what Jesus is asking of people when he's saying to treat people who you wouldn't see as your neighbors in at all, to treat them like your neighbors, to love your enemies. That's what it means for Jesus to say for the Samaritan to help the Jew. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't think I have any enemies. At least I hope I don't. <laughs> I'm not aware of it. At least I, I don't think I ever have either. But I think we can understand what it means to love your enemy. It's to love someone who doesn't look like us. It's to love someone who doesn't talk like us. It's to love someone who may not live like us. It's to, it's to love the person who winds us up. It's to... Love the person who votes the opposite way to us. It's to, um, it's to love the person who likes pineapple on pizza. Like, it's, it's to love our enemies. <laughs> That's who Jesus calls us to love. Not just the people we like, but the people we don't. So that's the first thing. Second thing. Two of the guys in the description, in the story, sorry, get a description. The priest and the Levite. So again, in thinking about the pantomime, when Jesus mentioned these guys listening to him, they'd probably get a a pop. They probably get a little, hey, Jews would have loved the priests and the Levites. Um, these good guys, um, like kind of held in high regard, well-respected people. Um, and now we might have a little understanding of, of what these people are like. We might understand a little bit of um, the connotations that we might associate with a priest or a Levite. But to the audience that's listening to Jesus, they would have known exactly who he was talking about. From, from the way that they dressed to what they looked like to what they'd just done with their day to where they were going and where they were coming from. They would have understood the context. And those kind of things go a little bit amiss on us. Um, so we're just going to try and understand the context of that a little bit more. But before we do, we're just going to take an opportunity to talk to the person next to you again, just for 30 seconds. This will make sense in a moment. What's the longest walk you've ever been on in a day? The longest walk, I'm, miles, kilometers, or steps, I'm happy. I want a figure, I want a number. Cool. Does anyone care to shout out a figure? It doesn't have to be yours. It can be the person that you were talking to. My, I think mine is 38,000 steps in one day. Anyone beat 38,000 steps? Or if you can... Go on. 50. Wow. Yeah. Any more for any more 50? Anyone beat 50 going once? Oh, 
I asked for miles, kilometers, or steps, unfortunately. I don't know what that means. You could walk really slow. <laughs> 11 hours. Do you reckon that beats 50,000 steps? I don't know. We'll decide later. That's very impressive, though. Anyway, I said that this would make sense. The walk from Jerusalem to Jericho is, it takes about a day. And it is brutal. Um, you're going from, like, mountainous Jerusalem and you're essentially dropping down through this big ravine, basically like a desert, to Jericho, which is um, on the Dead Sea, which is literally the lowest point on earth. And this, this road, this route, was known for being a dangerous place and a dangerous walk, not just because of the terrain that you find yourself in, like dry, arid, dangerous, but because of the kind of people that you find there. Because um, you'd find all kinds of like, bad guys trying to do bad things and robbers trying to rob you and people trying to beat you up, as we've found here. So... This, this road was known as the way of blood, which kind of tells you everything you need to know. But the people listening to Jesus would have known this road well. And we know that the man who's been beaten up on um, is somewhere on this road. Um, and then along comes the priest. And the priests were, they were the top dogs in, um, in Jewish religious life. Priests were the descendants of Aaron, or Aaron, uh, the brother of Moses and the first high priest. And it's, it's thought that this priest was returning to Jericho, which may well have been his hometown, from Jerusalem, having just spent two weeks carrying out his priestly duties and basically working in the, in the temple in Jerusalem. So he's on his way home. And um, priests aren't paid a salary as such, but rather they would, um, they would take home a tithe of what was given. So they basically take home like 10% of the 10% that was given as an offering or a sacrifice at the temple. So... Um, you t- you're talking like foods, you're talking grains, wheat, wine, oils, that kind of stuff. That, that is their pay. That is what they take home with them. So not only is this, this priest walking home after two long, tiring weeks of, of work in the temple, he's also walking home with uh, the stuff that's going to kind of feed his family and sustain them for the next however long. Now, because that's really important here, because the priest is a holy man, as you can probably guess. He, he knows and he upkeeps the law. He knows what is right and he knows what is wrong. And he loves the Lord and he wants to please him. He knows that this guy is pretty much as good as dead. And if he helps him, he's probably going to die on his watch. And that's a problem. Because in the Mosaic law, touching a dead body is a problem. Like, touching a dead body, unless you're a doctor at any time, is probably a bad thing. But for Jews in particular, it is a real problem because according to the Mosaic law, it's defiling. It's unclean. And if this guy dies on his watch and this priest has touched him, that means that he's got to go away for a week and sanctify himself and become clean again before he can come back into the world. Not only has he got to do that, but his stuff as well, the stuff that he's bringing with him. So it's not only him that becomes defiled, but everything he's carrying with him comes defiled as well, and it becomes ruined effectively. So there's a lot playing through this priest's mind in this moment. It's, it's not quite as simple as a man on the side of the road and I walk past. Because when we put ourselves in this guy's shoes, it's, very, it's quite easy to see, like, does that sound worth it? Is it worth the risk? It's easy to see why he might just decide to walk on by. Because his devotion and his commitment to keeping the law takes priority over the needs of the man in front of him. And not just any man, but a Jewish man. Someone who the expert of the law, as we've read, explains is his neighbor. That he's supposed to be looking out for. But the priest in this moment is walking past his neighbor. In trying to keep the law, he's neglecting the needs of his neighbor. And he walks on by. Now the Levite, similarly, the Levites worked in the temple. They were, the, uh, they were like the assistants to the priest. They would help with sacrificial duties. They were the worship leaders. They'd do um, readings, that kind of stuff. And interestingly, again, it's, it's likely that this Levite may well have worked with the priest who's walking along the road, who's just walked past. It may well be his boss. It may well be the person that he's just spent two weeks working alongside. And historically, there's a a bit of tension between um, the priests and the Levite for a number of reasons. Um, The the priests and the Levites um, 
like the, the Levites were subordinate to the priests. And there's a little bit of a power play dynamic here. And when you, when you add into that kind of the honor, shame culture of the time, um, you can appreciate why the priest will be walking on ahead and the Levite would be kind of trailing behind because there's kind of something to prove here. And just like the priest, the Levite wouldn't receive a salary, but would take home a portion of the offerings for him and his family. And because of the nature of his role, because of the nature of the people that he works with, he wouldn't have wanted to dishonor the priest. He wouldn't want to give the impression that he's acting out of line or not doing what people would expect of him. And imagine if the Levite rocks up in his hometown with a naked, bloody man who's possibly dead, probably half dead, on his donkey or strung over his back. Like we've already talked about how that would be defiling, how that would be unclean, how that would be like totally frowned upon. He's risking that humiliation and that shame from his own people for, for acting in such a way. Because for the Levite, he's more concerned with keeping up appearances. Making sure that people's perceptions about him are maintained. Not dishonoring his boss. His desire to, to please people outweighs his desire to help this man in need. So like the priest before him, he just walks on by. And then along comes the Samaritan. And then along comes the Samaritan. Come on. The least likely of the characters, usually the end of a joke. But in this story, he's the person that's celebrated. He's the person that's admired. And, you know, we've talked about the significance of, of what it means for him to crop up in this story. And the reason I mentioned the Levite, the priest, and the Samaritan here is because tonight I want to ask us the question, are we the priest? Do you love following the rules? Forgive me if this is a little bit direct, but do you use the scriptures to justify your prejudices towards people? to justify your judgment of others. You know, like, they've made their choice. They're just going to spend it all on drugs anyway. Oh no, I wouldn't go to that part of town, it's rough as anything. Because I know that they're words that have left my mouth. Or are you the Levite? Concerned with what people might think about you. Living for the affirmation and gratification of others. So focused on making sure that your friends like you that you, you ignore the person who's sitting on their own at lunchtime or sitting on their own in a lecture theatre. We're not standing up for the person who's, who's the butt of a joke. Why are you the Samaritan? Putting aside your prejudice, putting aside the shame and the humiliation that you might receive for doing what you've done, but choosing to see the man on the other side of the road beaten, broken, hurting, half dead as your neighbor, as your brother, as someone in need. Because if Jesus was walking past, best believe he'd be there. And you know, I hope, I hope we're all like the Samaritan, but, but I, I know as well as anybody here that we're all human. And I also know as well as anybody here that our, our culture speaks a good game on tolerance and inclusion. But in reality, I'm not sure that our, our talk always matches our walk. Because in, in a lot of social circles these days where inclusion and, and tolerance are rightfully celebrated, actually we find it quite hard to be around people that aren't like us. It doesn't take long to read the news to realize that our, our politics is so polarized that in, in certain rooms, just saying that you might vote conservative would have you thrown out the door. Or on the other end of the spectrum, that just a few miles up the road from here, that people decided it was a good idea to try and set a hotel on fire that was housing asylum seekers and refugees who are in our country fleeing war. And if I can go there, 
even on issues around like gender and sexuality and sexual ethics, that holding a certain opinion on those kind of things might cause you to lose your job or lose your livelihood. And now I'm, I'm not wanting to go on like a bit of a free speech rant, because um, I, I, I really don't think that free speech means that you can be a, a douchebag, but you know, this, this happens all across the spectrum. But what about if for us here in, in 2024 in St. Thomas Crooks in rainy Sheffield, maybe you just moved to the city, maybe you've been here for a while, maybe you're bored of your job, maybe you're loving life, whatever it looks like for you. What about if being a good Samaritan looked like allowing Jesus to reorientate our hearts for others? to be more like his, to have his heart, to see people the way he does, to listen to people the way he does, to not cast them aside, to not demonize, to not degrade, but to see people for who they really are, not just who we think they are. to show mercy to those who, who might not be our, our enemies as such, but definitely wouldn't be our neighbors. And listen, if we're, if we're going to be a church for the city, and if you're, if you're new to SDC, that's our, that's our mission statement. That's our vision, to be a church for the city. And I trust and believe that we are and that we're increasingly becoming so. But, and I'm speaking to myself, we're going to need to get a whole lot better at this. I'm going to need to get a whole lot better at this because I need to confess to Jesus my prejudice. I need to confess to Jesus my judgment and ask for forgiveness. I need to say, Lord, help me. Help me love like you. Help me pray like you. Help me see people like you do. Help me to show mercy to others, just like the mercy I've known. And that should be our prayer all the more in this next season for us as a church, if you're up for the ride. And you know, it might be hard. It might be tricky. It might be challenging. Often it is. You know, when Jesus talks about pruning, it's hard. It's painful, but man, is it worth it. That fruit is so sweet. It's life-giving, it's life-changing.